Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the uh, Open Education Network Summit. Thank you for joining us today uh, for, for this session, which is our keynote address for the week, titled Open Education Initiatives at the Nation's Tribal Colleges and Universities. My name is David Ernst. I'm the Executive Director of the Open Education Network. And if you're not familiar with the OEN, we're a community of higher education organizations working together to make education more equitable, accessible, and affordable through open education. You can learn more about us at open.umn.edu slash OEN. And Barb put that link in the chat. Before we begin, the OEN is housed at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. Um, the University of Minnesota Twin Cities is located on traditional ancestral and contemporary lands of indigenous people. The university resides on Dakota land. It was ceded in the treaties of 1837 and 1851, but we acknowledge this place has a complex and layered history. This land acknowledgement is one of the ways in which we work to educate the campus and the community about this land and our relationships with it and with each other. We're committed to the ongoing efforts to recognize, support, and advocate for American Indian nations and peoples. So um, you should also feel free to acknowledge the indigenous people to whom the land you're situated on belongs um, in the chat, if you feel so inclined. As we begin the session, uh, I need to share a few important details with you before we, we begin. Uh, this webinar is being recorded. And for that reason, you have been muted. The video transcripts and slides will be posted on the OEN's 2021 YouTube Summit playlist after the summit has concluded. Thank you, Janelle. Um, the last part of today's session will be for questions. To submit a question for our presenters, please use the Q and A feature in Zoom. Questions are anonymous. And we'll have a chance to ask, um, we'll, we'll probably not have a chance to ask all of the questions to presenters, but we'll certainly do our best. Uh, the chat will have a space to share, the chat will be the space to share additional comments or reactions. Um, we are committed to providing a friendly, safe and welcoming environment. Um, please join us in creating a safe and constructive space. Um, let's see, the hashtag on Twitter uh, for the summit is OEN Summit 21. Join us on Twitter at OpenEd underscore network. Uh, and with all of that out of the way, um, I'd like you to now please uh, join me in welcoming today's presenter, Al Kushlikas, Senior Associate for Strategic Initiatives at AHEC. Hi, Al. Very good. Thanks, David, very much. Um, and it's an honor for me to, uh, to be here uh, to speak to you about the Tribal College Movement, and in particular, our Tribal College's participation in the Open Education Movement, which is, which is really kind of just getting off the ground now. We're initiating some activities that are uh, in addition to, which I'll talk about, which, which in addition to the Open Education Movement are, um, uh, resonant, or th th we see them as, or at least I see them as a vehicle for bringing open education to a much broader application than, than I'm aware of. And being new to the open education network, I know there's a lot that's going on out there that I'm not aware of that's innovative and, and, um, and exciting that we do want to connect with. So anyway, thanks again very much for taking the time and thank you all for, um, for attending, um, and Al, can you all see my screen? Okay. Yep, Al. We um, we see the presenter screen. Oh, you do. So I got to flip it. Okay. Yep, yep. Uh, Thank you. Thanks for letting me know. Okay. How does that look? Is that good? Uh, not yet. At least I'm not seeing it. Your screen sharing is paused. Now, why is that? Um, what are what are you seeing right now? Same screen with a menu that popped up. Um, sorry about that. 
Let me try and, uh, okay, I swap again. Now what do, we, what do you get? Actually, nothing is changing. Oh, okay, try it one more time. It's not, oh, really? Right. You see, okay. Yep. Yeah. Try it one more time. Yeah. Okay, hang on. Yep. Sorry. No. Okay, how's that? Miguel uh, suggests duplicating slideshow, the other option. It worked a minute ago, right? Yeah, it did. It did. <laughs> yeah, strange, okay. Yeah, someone else suggested try duplicating slideshow as well. Oh, okay, okay, let's see what that does. How's that? Uh, not yet. Now it seems almost frozen. It does seem almost frozen, doesn't it? Oh, there, oh okay. Let's try oh, now it's scrolling through. Uh, there's a there's a poltergeist in here somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> and now it's it's gone. Yeah, let's try it one more time. Al, if you'd like me to pull it up over here um, and just tell me when to advance the slides, I've got it up and can try it and see if yeah, it's Yeah, let me just try it one more time. And then maybe then let's yeah. do that. Perfect. Yeah, crazy. Cra crazy yet perfect. Oh, okay, what do, you, what do you see now? Your screen, but not this, yeah, the whole thing, PowerPoint and everything, application. Okay, okay how about now? That looks good. Really, it does? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Good. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks for your patience. Um, I can imagine people would have dropped off about now. So uh, what I want to do is a kind of an intro to the tribal college movement. You know, who the tribe, where the tribal college, colleges are, who they are, who they serve, what they do, and what why it's important what they do, and then a uh, description of the our work with the OEN. And then kind of uh, sort of an aspirational discussion of where we'd like to go with, with OEN as far as uh, addressing uh, tribal community priorities. So there's 70, uh, 75 tribal college sites operated by 37 tribal colleges, 35 of which are accredited. Uh, two of them are in the process of being accredited. As you can see, they're, they're uh, scattered mostly west of the Mississippi, uh, the Great Plains have, have a large, fairly large concentration of tribal colleges, uh, the Southwest as well, and a number in the, in the Midwest, the, the, um, the Woodlands uh, tribal colleges, uh, serving more than 88,000. That number has changed somewhat, has dropped since COVID, but uh, uh, generally uh, serving at around 88 to 90,000 students you know, a whole variety of programs, whole range of programs. Um, the tribal colleges are basically located where there are large, especially where there are larger tribal communities. All the Montana and North Dakota tribes have tribal colleges. The largest tribes in the Southwest uh, uh, have um, uh, uh, tribal colleges too for the Navajo Nation, in fact. And the tribal colleges are a relatively young uh, uh, movement. Tribal colleges started in, the first tribal college started on the Navajo Nation in 1968, and it's grown uh, fairly, uh, fairly rapidly. It grew to eight or nine in the mid seventies. And then from then it's been growing steadily. The whole idea of tribal uh, higher education is basically providing a, a higher education set of services that meet the needs of tribal communities. Uh, the experiment of having tribal, tribal students, native students attend the regional universities at first did not work out that well because of the lack of um, a set of support mechanisms to, sort, to support students who oftentimes leave, the, leave their community for an extended, extended period of time for the very first time. And the social uh, and and the, well, really, the social challenges are were experiences being fairly daunting. So the idea a of providing a, a, a ed, higher education resources locally um, and b making them locally relevant, culturally uh, culturally resonant, incorporating language and culture and in instruction, which you're not going to find it at mainstream universities. Um, and so the tribal college movement has, has evolved to be 
more than a, 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 a an option for higher education. They are really change agents, change agents in their communities. They provide research. They provide community development, net, uh, networking with uh, regional and national resources to address local tribal, tribal needs. They're really, they've really become they've taken on a very essential role in nation building. The whole idea of nation building, sustained, sustainable tribal uh, communities that have uh, uh, economic, uh, a, a, a solid economic foundation, that have uh, adequate health and, and community services. Um, the tribal colleges, I won't say that they're the, the only solution to issues confronting tribal nations, but they're, they're definitely an important part of the solution. So I'll kind of skim through the rest of the intro. I think, I think I've made the point of, of the role of tribal colleges in their communities and that they are very multifunctional, that they provide a whole range of uh, workforce development, research, community support uh, resources, health being another one, and uh, community relevant curricula. Um, so, uh, so we were recently funded just a few months ago by the Hewlett Foundation to really take an aggressive approach, uh, a much more aggressive approach to engaging tribal, tribal colleges in the open education network, in the open education movement. So we're being funded, oh, uh, one of the primary, well, not primary, but one of the more important activities is actually engaging uh, uh, tribal college faculty and students in open education resources. So that's kind of a, a, a I don't wanna say typical, but a, I think a, an expected uh, approach, that we're taking a kind of a typical approach to accomplishing that through training, using OEN trainers to work with our librarians and our faculty to, to become facile and uh, accessing open education resources, making decisions, making textbook decisions. So the sort of the infrastructure for OEN in, uh, implementation at tribal colleges is uh, an important, but I won't say it's a primary activity under this Hewlett Foundation award. Um, something that's a little more, uh, or I'll, I'll say equally important, is the, um, the goal of engaging tribal college faculty and students in developing content. And what we're basically looking at is a, the open pedagogy model, where faculty and students are creating content, not textbooks, but content that can be shared broadly with, uh, with tr other tribal colleges, with other uh, higher ed institutions, with, um, with uh, significant enrollment of American Indian Alaska Native students, and then more broadly with uh, any uh, higher education institution and faculty at those institutions that want to broaden the perspective of any course that they offer to bring in uh, or to bring in or contextualize content with American Indian perspective and Alaska Native perspective. So that's, uh, uh, and ultimately the idea, one of the ideas is that by doing that, by creating content that it's, that's more relevant, more culturally and locally connected, that uh, it'll lead to uh, greater engagement on the part of undergraduate students, AIN and undergraduate students, excuse me. So that's our, that's kind of in a, a 20,000 foot uh, level, that's our, that's our project. Short term, I mentioned providing workshop training, workshop uh, training through workshops with OEN uh, uh, trainers, um, engaging TCU faculty and students in creating content and encouraging the, the use of access and use of that content more broadly, Sp starting with tribal colleges, but opening it up to any higher ed institution that wants to take advantage of, of the opportunity to broaden the um, the uh, the range of the of the treatment of a topic uh, of a given topic, you know, and the topics that we're talking about, we're starting with environmental science uh, because that is an important uh, uh, 
area of, educa of educational programming at tribal colleges, um, they, almost all of them have environmental science programs. And almost all of them are in some sense or in some way engaged in climate change issues uh, in their communities. So it seemed like a low hanging fruit uh, working with uh, work focusing on environmental science. Uh, long term goals. So we'd like to make this a uh, uh, post uh, you know period of the of the award. We want to make this a sustainable continuing process of generating content, local uh, contextualized content that we share broadly among the tribal colleges and beyond. Uh, I keep hitting the wrong button there. Uh, promoting or establishing an educational ecosystem where this content is available and used across the, the, the education uh, spectrum high school, grade school, uh, middle school students, uh, uh, teachers can access and hopefully incorporate this content um, as well as undergraduate uh, programs. Again, the idea being that it's a vehicle to, to incorporate uh, uh, a, a stronger uh, uh, local, locally informed, culturally informed experience for students. For, for all AI and American Indian Alaska Native students. So the idea of a, of a cultural framework that incorporates uh, open education as a part of the, the learning experience. So I, I'm sure you all know, or most of you already know about open pedagogy, uh, but just a, a real quick, just to provide a little context for this discussion. Um, engaging learners uh, as creators of information, not just consumers, uh, being a, a, a form of experiential learning where students are actually involved in the creation of, of, of or creation of, uh, of a vehicle for conveying knowledge. Um, their, the, their contents, their products would be openly licensed and totally shared. And Finally, and this is really more of the indigenous part uh, or aspect of it is where the entire community is encouraged to participate in the knowledge building. Um, the, the, the idea that there are um, knowledge holders tra like traditionalists who we're losing all the time as, you know, as people age and especially with COVID, it's important to get these and it, not only traditionalists, but anyone with a with a perspective that provides local knowledge uh, some form of local knowledge having them available and encouraged to contribute to this basically a, a, an open education knowledge base and then this knowledge base is something that i think is important for any community or i should say every community to develop and maintain and supplement so it's not just where any school, any any higher ed institution uh, in the world uh, provides content that's similar to, that provides a, a learning experience that's similar to any other uh, uh, provider of higher education services. The idea is to make that as locally relevant um, and, and as locally focused on the, the education and workforce needs of the community. That, that's kind of what we're what we're shooting for. And again, I mentioned this is sort of an aspirational target, but that's what we're trying to do. So uh, our project, our Hewlett uh, Foundation funded project, we're recruiting teams, as I mentioned, to develop content in a whole range of areas, environmental science. I mentioned we, we're, we're, we're starting with that because of the prevalence of uh, environmental science programs but social sciences, health professions, for all areas of, uh, of focus um, that we eventually want to bring into this uh, uh, initiative. Provide training and support, provide training and supporting in developing digital, digital materials that, uh, that can be used to share the content. So the, the, the hope is that we encourage faculty and students, especially students, to be creative in how they not only be creative in how they create digital media, 
but create uh, digital media that conveys the content in a way that's also culturally resonant. So it's sort of like uh, building uh, uh, education resources that are that are relevant in more than one dimension. In the way it's presented, you know, as McLuhan said, the, the medium is a message. Uh, so the way it's delivered and the actual content that's being delivered. Uh, any any questions while uh, while I grab a, a sip of tea? I'm only getting warmed up, so um, so we'll see how this goes. As a as a as a reminder, if anyone does have questions, you can certainly put those in the Q and A. Um, and Al, we have one that just came in that uh, asks uh, for. Do you have any examples of like learning objects that you might be creating and managing? Uh, I don't right at the moment, uh, but if I I could have been I should have been prepared to bring some uh, bring some uh, to share. Uh, if so, if anyone's interested in any of this, just send me an email, and I'll send you some examples, send you some uh, some further information about what, what we're trying to do. Admittedly, this is an ambitious project that the foundation of which is our relationship to OEN and uh, the open the open education movement. So the idea of an open learning community. And I mentioned that we bring in a, a larger representation of the community to develop content, to share, I, to share perspective and ideas specifically around uh, some education challenges that, that tribal communities are facing. And number one, and this is global, of course, environmental sustainability and climate change, uh, providing a, the idea is that the, the the priority is that given that most uh, indigenous communities glo globally, if not all indigenous communities globally, lack local resources to respond uh, um, effectively and in a timely way to, to climate change challenges, uh, extreme weather events, uh, uh, rising uh, ocean uh, levels, uh, uh, extended periods of periods of drought, um, species, uh, uh, invasive species, all these are creating challenges that uh, that small uh, and relatively remote indigenous communities don't have the local resources necessarily to to uh, to address, and there's not there aren't enough global resources to 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 direct at all the communities that are challenged. So the idea is that through uh, engaged community uh, work and open open learning, open education is a vehicle for that to, to, to happen. Um, communities can identify issues, identify possible uh, solutions, and share them across communities. Um, and that's a that's an open education, that's that's certainly within the purview of open education. I keep hitting that. La language preservation is another really huge issue. And, and again, there's just not enough uh, research, there's not enough uh, resources, including researchers, to, uh, to help communities, especially now post COVID, how many fluent language speakers have been lost. Um, there's just not enough resources out there to, to depend on. Communities have to take this, language communities have to take this up upon themselves. And then finally, the maintaining, not finally, this is a short list, there's a lot more if we had time, uh, maintaining cultural identity within the larger uh, uh, cultural ecosystem, the global cultural ecosystem, and how much of that is, is technology driven. So, an indigenous community-based open, open education system, uh, engaging, as I mentioned, en engaging learners at all stages, at all levels, uh, adult learners, uh, young learners, in, in, including them in this community of, of open pedagogy, which is not just consuming content, but creating content. Um, learning and, uh, let's see, incorporating cultural uh, 
of values into the process as a vehicle for, for cultural preservation and including the whole uh, cultural, social, physical ecosystem. That's the idea of, of helping with local community-based problem solving and decision making. Getting the open education, getting open education or open learning as a resource to support local community decision making, where for where information and knowledge around rapidly changing circumstances, especially with things like climate change and language loss, uh, require an, an agile, you know, learning approach. And this is a nice uh, quote: uh, Our identities are rich and complex because they are produced within rich and comp complex set of relations of practice. So the idea of relations of practice, and, and then there's just to bring in as a as a kind of a, a, a parenthetical comment, the idea of intersectionality, that uh, which I I think uh, is is absolutely accurate. That every any individual is comprised of a whole range of, of um, identifications, some of which are traditional, if you're, a, if you're an indigenous person, some of which are, are traditional and connected to, um, to, your, uh, to your tribe, and others which are uh, regional, uh, national, and global. Uh, bringing in that whole set of relations that are relevant to a problem is uh, is 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 a goal. I, I, again, it's aspirational. Uh, we, we, it has, there has to be some application and rel uh, research done to to determine the um, the the, the reason, reasonableness of the idea. Uh, so ep epistemological pluralism, and I think I've kind of implied this all the way through that traditional knowledge, traditional practice. Are, are relevant to, um, are important and of value to not, not only to indigenous communities, but globally. They bring a perspective. Indigenous knowledge brings a perspective on, on problems. You know, you hear a lot about traditional ecological knowledge, which is really important. It's based on many generations of observations of, of natural, naturally occurring events within an area um, that's it tra traditional ecological knowledge is absolutely important but i believe just as important is traditional knowledge practice the way knowledge is obtained the way it's shared the way um knowledge holders are um are incorporated in in uh discussions about um uh, decision making dis discussions uh, for the community. So it's it's a false, I keep doing that. There's a false dichotomy between indigenous knowledge and Western knowledge. There, there, and there's not one indigenous knowledge. There's as many indigenous types of knowledge as there are indigenous groups. Uh, it's a false dichotomy. There, there it, knowledge is valid. It depends on how you apply it and the problem that you're trying to solve with, uh, uh, by app, by applying knowledge. So uh, one more kind of a background uh, uh, discussion about collaborative learning and metacognition. So collaborative learning, the idea, the fact, the the phenomenon of uh, when people work in teams, they they learn as a group. That they acquire knowledge, they bring in their own the knowledge that they come to the team or the group that's working on a project, uh, but they also collaboratively build knowledge, collaborative learning. And then metacognition, the idea that you've got a metacognition, which I, I love the term and there's a lot of, there's a lot of definitions of it, uh, but I'm using it metacognition as a, as a form of cognition that includes, that includes groups, that includes the environment within the group is operating, that includes the, the, the mechanisms for making decisions and acting on those decisions, metacognition. Um, where uh, open education can serve the needs of a community, the metacognitive needs of a community is, uh, is I think an area of research and applied 
open education practice that needs to be uh, further investigated. Um, and maybe it has, again, I don't know exactly everything that's been done, but it's an area of uh, open education, I think that's, that's a high priority to, to develop. And that's what we're, what, we're, um, what we're aspiring to focus on. So the idea of uh, macro cognition and ep epistemological pluralism, this is, a, is not a, by any means an exhaustive list of, uh, of um, comparing common assumptions of macro cognition and what brings uh, different perspectives, the importance of bringing in different perspectives. Expertise comes from learning standardized rules and procedures. Knowledge is generated. However, that, while, while that's true, it's also true that knowledge is generated from experience driven by relationships that is um, place-based, uh, place-based and community-based. Uh, problem solving starts with a clear description of goals. There are some wicked problems and climate change is certainly one of them that may require waiting, uh, 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 may require not defining the goals specifically because they may restrict the set of solutions that you may come up with. Uh, learning progresses by building data, going from data to information, to knowledge, to understanding, very, all very well. But the, the mental model that you come in with, and that's where indigenous frameworks provide a different mental model uh, that, that may lead to different types of data and then a different route from data to understanding. Um, and again, sort of repeating that, and uncertainty is reduced by gathering more information. Very true. But sometimes if you don't frame the data, you miss information. If, if frame the data, you, you miss opportunities for transforming data to, to actionable uh, information. So all this to argue that a, a community-based, uh, broadly community-based open education initiative can bring uh, problem solving tools to communities that otherwise just wouldn't exist and broadly sh and could that could be broadly shared. So uh, uh, community resilience and OEM uh, and I, I would I'll kind of uh, repeat myself in saying that it's a distributed pro uh, and shared problem solving model where there's broad engagement of multiple stakeholders and the stakeholders are students, uh, uh, and these are learners, students, elders, farmers, fishers, ranchers, educators, tribal, uh, tribal governmental natural resource, land management personnel, and others, con others concerned, other stakeholders concerned with emerging climate related issues. That's in the community. And then you bring in the larger perspective of the whole climate change community, the, the University Centers for Atmospheric Research, the National Ecological Observatory Network, you know, regional universities that are many of, most of which are in, involved in some form of climate research. They also get plugged in. They, of course, they have to be. Uh, and it's sustained. And the interaction among these stakeholders needs to be sustained so that the, the benefits of a, of a metacognitive system that, uh, that, 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 that draws on the, the collective knowledge of these stakeholders can, can happen. So, uh, so just, a, just a quick comment that we do have a, a pilot of this model right now, and that is where we've recruited fac, uh, students and faculty from seven tribal colleges, most of, most of them in North Dakota, but some in Montana and in, and in Nebraska, essentially coming together to identify uh, community climate change issues that can be monitored. Uh, the idea is to develop this environment, environmental monitoring system, uh, drones, environmental drones, uh, weather stations, uh, uh, different types of uh, field uh, like spectrometer uh, uh, analytic units, collecting data and monitoring the data over time. You know, starting with, uh, um, or working from data that's already accessible through the USDA uh, weather station network, for example, um, the, the uh, applied climate um, information system that NOAA has, accessing this data that's, that's 
relevant to, to, to the tri to tribal communities that are involved with this pilot and building off of that to uh, collect and analyze local data and share it with tribal leaders to support their decision-making, the, the decision-making around climate resilience. Uh, so we're, we're putting that in place right now and piloting it uh, this summer. And the idea is that we'll start with a foundation of, of, of environmental monitoring, bring in additional stakeholders uh, with expertise around specific issues and grow this as, a, as just a, a part of the climate uh, um, resilience uh, work of tribal colleges in their, and tribal communities. Ah, okay. So I, I'm actually almost done now. Uh, the, uh, the idea of macrocognition and, and climate resilience, um, there's, there's a time component, things happen very quickly, multiple players, multiple stakeholders. Uh, there can be vague goals when the issues aren't well-defined, a lot of uncertainty, and, the, and the, the whole situation is very dynamic. Bringing in multiple stakeholders to participate in the, in the in, I call it a learning process because that's what it is. Identifying, observing, identifying issues, sharing, discussing, and responding to them in a, in a collective manner uh, is, uh, it, it is basically the model. And finally, uh, these are all dimensions of the, uh, of, the, um, the, of the challenge of responding to climate change. Plan planning, sense making of the data that's being collected, collect collecting the right data, coordinating this work. Um, this is well beyond open education for sure, but there is a role for open education in supporting this, uh, the, the, these, uh, these components of the issue, of the issue of, of responding uh, effectively and in a timely manner to, to climate challenges. And that applies to COVID, it applies to uh, health issues more broadly, the same idea of a community learning system. And the learning system starts with, it's as a learning system, it starts with good data. It starts with an, an engaged set of stakeholders um, working together, motivated and working together to address the issue. And I, that's it, that is my last slide. So I, I, I know I, I've spoken a lot of uh, a lot about ideas and and goals that are at this point still aspirational. Some of some components of which are in place, others still that need to be developed. But but all of it and my my thesis here is that all of this builds on and draws from the the experience of the open education movement. So with that, uh, are there any questions? And thank you for those of you that hung in there for the whole time. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Al. That was really wonderful. I just on a personal note, I think your the the connection with community is just amazing to me. Like I my ears perk up whenever it, it, all the parts of it. Like it's uh where your you, your the knowledge generation comes from the community. The app the purpose of the knowledge creation is about the community and solving problems and generating solutions. The whole anyway, all of the pieces about connecting community, I think, are just so fascinating. So, um, we do have some questions. Um, ah, very good. So, uh, there's one, let's see, but I think you answered this one, so I think we're okay. But, um, Heather asked, Will language learning objects be part of the open pedagogy? So, in other words, will language learning be part of um, a part of that? But yes, absolutely, yes, that, that's that's definitely the case. We do have a project right now with uh, Dakota, Lakota language where we have uh, where we're, we're identifying uh, fluent speakers who can translate uh, existing text existing um, documents in Lakota or record I should say recorded recordings in Lakota into uh, into documents that can be shared openly so really that's the idea is to in general not just for any one language group to um, to translate, to share, to um, to make available all the language resources that are uh, recordings, um, uh, uh, 
in some cases there are there is some uh, some literature that's been developed uh, sharing and making it available for uh, for app for for learning applications however people want to use them you know that is such an urgent need uh, for sure great thank you um, uh, let's see uh, Janelle asks um, uh, whether the newly created materials will be Creative Commons licensed or have traditional knowledge labels or both or neither or something else. Yes, yes, and, and totally yes. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it really depends on the content. There will be content that's not culturally sensitive, that can be shared without any restrictions. And that'll be, I think, most of the content. But there will be cases where traditional knowledge uh, and that that will often include traditional knowledge that can be widely and broadly shared. But there are some cases where traditional knowledge is restricted and, you know, only uh, members of the community. And, that, and that's a decision that's made by the community. You know, we certainly don't uh, uh, don't have a role in that. It's the community that decides whether something is appropriate to be shared or not. Where the, in the cases where it is appropriate and allowed, then that content is going to be freely available and, and creative uh, commons license. I hope that does answer that question. Okay. Um, uh, Amy asked, well, she actually said, this isn't a question, just wanted to say to Al, congrats on the grant and thanks <laughs> for all the info about a the AHAP work underway. Very exciting. So um, uh, thank you. Uh, Judith asks, she says, fascinating and kudos on the Hewlett Foundation grant. Question, how challenging will it be to engage and enroll participants, including students and faculty within the tribal college system? And what do you think would be some strategies for getting them on board? Oh, that's a great question. Um, if, if, if we're talking about the, I think you are, you're talking about developing the content uh, that can be shared, that would be shared. Um, the it's not that it's not that difficult to uh, recruit students to work on projects. Well, and maybe I'm overstating the case that it's not that difficult to recruit recruit students to work on projects where there's a, a strong local community relevance or or perceived need for that work. So it was not that difficult for us to recruit the students for the summer uh, climate change project. You know, and the ones that that rec that we recruited, they definitely have a strong commitment. They're they they're demonstrating a strong commitment to participating in the work. Uh, as far and and that's also true in general for the for the students who take the the environmental science classes at their at their at their respective colleges, that those are popular courses and and getting them uh, recruiting them. Uh, at least to take the courses is not is not that much of a challenge. That I'll say I'll start with that. Actually, getting them to uh, to, to produce uh, digital media content that we can share that's uh, that that's yet to be established. How how uh, how smooth that's going to go? Our idea is right now we've got this summer we have our twelve. Uh, uh, funded to do the summer research uh, experience for undergraduates program. One of our colleges, Blackfeet Community College, has a funded project where there's a team of students who are doing similar work on the the, the Blackfeet Nation, who are um, who are also theoretically available to to participate, basically to develop a report on what they're doing. Um, and what they're doing involves thing, includes things like interacting with the community, uh, um, going out and collecting uh, data, uh, making observations and collecting data in the in the in the, in the area on tribal land. Uh, so I guess I'm the 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 pieces are there. The the, the motivated students are there. The the piece that that will establish is uh, viable. Is that we provide the training and technical support, which we have. We have a 
a professional digi di digital media uh, person at Ilasava College, our college in, in Alaska, who's providing the training and the support to these students. So that's where the rubber meets the road. The pieces are there. Uh, and, the, and again, I think the motivation on the part of the students is there, but I can't, uh, I can't guarantee that we're gonna get really good results or that those results are gonna generate, are gonna lead to really high quality content. I'm confident that we're gonna get a, a, a fair amount of content just to get things started. And, 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 a, and kind of a big part of the model is, is uh, uh, the diffusion of innovation model. You know, where are you gonna get a small group, a relatively modest group of early adopters who say, this is a great idea, I wanna do this. It's, you know, for multiple reasons, because of the topic, because I wanna learn digital media skills, which uh, by the way, are very, high, very um, hireable, not hireable, what's the word I'm thinking of? very marketable. <laughs> so, um, so those early adopters, I think will, will help us set the, set the, um, set the wheel in motion. And the more, and we're going to do this. And again, I mentioned National Museum of the American Indian, that there are vehicles for us to, for them to get their work out, uh, that, uh, that other students will see other community members will see. They don't all have to be students and say, yeah, this is something I, I see that's important. I'd like to, Participate. The, we we currently AHEC has a uh, the student the annual annual student conference, uh, which is every March and like around three thousand students participate every year. Um, we're including a, a digital media competition um, starting twenty twenty two, and the idea there will be we're going to let students know way ahead of time that. Their uh, digital media work is going to be um, uh, is is encouraged and is going to be um, highlighted during the conference. And that'll, that's another we see it as another vehicle for encouraging students, you know, a to get uh, good at uh, at expressing themselves with digital content, telling their story, you know, doing what they want to do, whatever they want to do, but then also applying those skills to specific uh, applications like uh, uh, um, uh, contextualized knowledge. Thank so you, somewhere Alan. in there, I think was an answer. <laughs> we have, uh, if you have more questions, please put them in the Q and A section. Um, uh, we have an another couple more here, and I think we can get to. Um, uh, Heather asks, what plans are there to share the environmental findings with lawmakers uh, of US uh, lawmakers of US government to facilitate protection from climate change? And she says, I'm thinking of collaborative efforts between the tribal leaders in Congress to pass laws for protection of the environment. Uh, that's a really good question. Right. Uh, but that's a really good question. I, I, we haven't pursued that yet. We do have vehicles for that though. AHEC is, among other things, AHEC is an advocacy organization. We're located in the Washington DC area and we have our present CEO and uh, our legislative affairs director interact with, uh, with uh, representatives on the Hill um, or members of Congress on the Hill uh, regularly um, and are, are always, or yeah, I guess you can say always involved in, in in helping to insert language in, in bills that are relevant to tribal colleges and tribal communities. So there, there's definitely going to be more emphasis on incorporating um, or targeting tribal communities with language that's relevant to their climate change issues. And, and what's interesting, you know, not even going as far as talking about uh, legislative uh, um, uh, uh, solutions. There's the fact that, you know, one thing that motivated this project with, uh, with North Dakota and incorporating weather stations as part of this environmental monitoring uh, uh, initiative is that we were told indirectly, so I can't quote somebody from the USDA, but that the Natural Resources Conservation Service informed a faculty member at one of our North Dakota colleges that the tribe that there that that uh, 
that chartered their that college where that college is located um, was not in court was not included in a, in a list of North North Dakota regions that are um, particularly hard hit by the by the drought and this was like a, a year ago um, that they didn't they didn't were not included in the listing simply because they lacked the data to con to be able to confirm that the case which told us tribal lands need to have uh, better uh, weather and climate data so that they are, they are included in lists like that. And, and those are lists that are important for, for USDA to decide on resources that are targeted to, to mitigate. So, so that is a priority for all our, will be, uh, not right now, we're, we're just developing, but it will be a priority for all the tribal colleges to make sure that there are not regions of tribal lands that are inadequately um, covered in, in terms of environmental monitoring. Um, and, in, and supplementing where there are specific issues that may, that may be more locally uh, unique. But yeah, really good question. Yeah, and, and Heather makes a comment here that um, seems actually pretty related to that. She says she watched a documentary called Chasing Coral that show the changes and transitions from a healthy ecosystem to the death of the coral and coral reef and, and the loss of animals that depend on them. She said, I'm thinking if you can document change in the environment, which I think is kind of what you're talking about with that North Dakota yes. project, right? That's, uh, the, and changes in the environment that's occurring because of the climate change, it would be a good educational media project. So yeah, that's, that, your that, that's exactly right. That, that is exactly right. We did have a, the NASA funded a project, uh, oh, seven or eight years ago, where they uh, acquired for a small group of tribal colleges a, um, uh, uh, a broadcast quality digital, you know, cameras and, and editing equipment, broadcast quality, you know, for something that could be um, uh, shared on commercial television. So about five tribal colleges were recruited for that project and each, and each one of them, faculty and students, focused on a local climate uh, climate change issue, and did a small you know treatment of it, five to ten minutes. I forget exactly what it was. And they interviewed uh, uh, community members, elders, you know, my, who talked about how things have changed since they were you know young, and uh, and all that was supposed to be collected and edited into one. Um, like hour long uh, documentary that would have been aired on something like PBS uh, or or some other you know discovery or something like that. It, it it was a really well conceived idea and really really great um, concept. It uh, it fell it fell apart because it turned out that the costs involved in actually doing the post production. Were, were more than what was available. So I think all that footage is sitting in the can somewhere waiting for somebody to complete. But that kind of an idea, you know, given resources, that that's exactly right. That's the sort of uh, information um, that, that needs to be shared more broadly, just like the, the death of coral reefs. Um, there's certainly examples of, of, uh, of um, uh, negative impacts of climate change all over. Right, right. And Heather adds, we need a website where we can all share observations of change in the environment, and collected memories. So, oh, well, that's a great, great idea. Yeah. Right. Do we have any additional questions? We have a few minutes left here in the hour. I'll give you another, another uh, minute here. Type them in the Q and A section. And, and one thing I throw out there while you all yeah. while while you all are thinking about questions, is that this really is a, a very uh, excuse the phrase open ended uh, initiative that we're absolutely looking and open to new partners, new ideas, new areas of research for implementing open education initiatives in you know a whole range of areas so um, if anyone's interested in, in actually engaging in some way we're we're you know we're all about partnerships 
Wonderful. Well, I uh, I don't see any other questions coming in, and Al, I'll add that you know we're really the OEN is definitely looking forward to partnering with you as you move forward on this and trying to figure out how open education fits into this and can add to it. And uh, thank you, thank you, Al, for for everything. We appreciate your sharing your your expertise with us today. Well, thank you very much for having me. And I'll close it out here. Say thank, thank, thanking the audience here. Um, thanks for joining us. And we want to remind you that today's webinar has been recorded. It'll be shared in the, the coming weeks. Um, you can subscribe to the YouTube playlist uh, to receive a notification, you know, when it arrives. And the slides and the transcripts will also be linked eventually. So um, you can keep the conversation going by joining us on Slack. Uh, at uh, oensummit21.slack.com. Um, and uh, if you are an OEN member, uh, we'll hope that you'll also continue the conversation in the, the normal OEM Google group. So thank you all. Thank you again, Al. And thanks everyone for joining us at today's session. Have a good week. Thank you. You as well. All right. Bye-bye.